Greetings and welcome to this Elephant podcast. This afternoon, we are honored to have with us Professor Yashma Gai, who is Kenya's most eminent constitutional lawyer and uh, played the most critical role in bringing about the new constitution um, here in Kenya. Um, that we are watching uh, come to life uh, in the middle of this uh, election conundrum that Kenya is in. Uh, welcome, Professor. Thank you. Um, Prof, when, when we Kenyans talk about um, events, we often animate inanimate objects. So uh, when you hear somebody say, the brakes in my car refused to work. Uh, and we're talking about the constitution in those terms right now. Uh, we have people, politicians especially in Kenya, talking about the constitution as not working uh, as it should. Uh, and we've had suggestions recently uh, coming out of the just concluded election and repeat election on the 26th of um, suggestions that perhaps we should have uh, the posts of prime minister, deputy prime minister. Uh, and for me, it feels very much like we've been there before. Yes. I wanted to get your comment as somebody who has been so central to the new constitution, constitutional dispensation that Kenya has now. Well, we uh, uh, considered that um, for a multi-ethnic society, uh, it was critical that uh, we have a parliamentary system which uh, both allows for uh, participation of uh, or sharing of power in a way uh, in the cabinet, but also the greater accountability that the government has to the people through the parliament. Uh, uh, the presidential uh, system uh, is overwhelming uh, and uh, the president has all the powers and we felt that this would not work in our society where uh, we are very diverse uh, and so we uh, uh, recommended parliamentary system which was adopted in CKRC and Burmas mm. but when the committee of experts met after the two or seven um, uh, killings uh, all the politicians uh, got together <laughs> and said uh, no we want a presidential system I think for the simple reason that each of the major uh, politicians thought he was going to win anyway, so why not grab all the power? And, uh, and the committee of experts gave in to them, though they warned them that uh, parliamentary was a better system. So we are now landed with the, uh, with the consequences of that. If I can comment on your other point about, uh, about blaming the in <laughs> in <laughs> inanimate uh, topic, uh, yes, we are. I think our constitution, though I shouldn't be saying that myself, <laughs> was the result of uh, very wide deliberations and a um, and lot of research, looking at our history, looking at people's aspirations, thought that the parliamentary system would be better. Uh, but then now then to turn around and to blame the constitution for which they are responsible, at least in respect of that uh, section, uh, is unfair. A uh, constitution is a piece of paper setting out uh, systems of government, national values, aspirations, but it's a piece of paper. And therefore, unless uh, those, all of us as citizens, as politicians, as civil servants, uh, follow the constitution, it's no use blaming the constitution. And I think what has happened here is that the politicians uh, have completely uh, disregarded the constitution. And in our present context, of course, the question of elections, the constitution is also somewhat unusual in, in providing a very broad, very detailed framework for elections. Yes. It talks a lot about what, we, what kind of uh, party would be registered for 
purposes of elections. Correct. It emphasizes the national values, national unity. It uh, speaks uh, against corruption, intimidation. So I was thinking, well, all the things that that chapter says you mustn't do, they did. <laughs> so why blame the poor, <laughs> poor constitution? <laughs> we are we are going into. Um, we have another constitutional pet, you know, petitions have uh, constitutional petitions. Mm -hmm. uh, well, let me say, electoral petitions have been presented to the Supreme Court. Uh, I was wondering whether you can speak to the um, to to the very existence of the Supreme Court and this very prescriptive um, these very prescriptive sections of the Constitution that I think emerged out of the 2007 crisis, which was an election-related crisis. Mm -hmm. So to fix it, we we uh, put into our constitution, um, uh, you know, demands on the political class, yeah. which as you just said, um, they have not um, really um, lived up to. We then find ourselves in a situation where we had an election in August mm -hmm. that was contested before the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. The presidential election was annulled. Mm -hmm. um, a repeat election was held in October, mm -hmm. on the 26th of October. And more petitions have been presented to um, the, the Supreme Court. Can you tell us a little bit about the Supreme Court, uh, its, its roles and responsibilities mm -hmm. here, but also how it works in other countries? Mm -hmm. Because uh, there are people obviously asking, uh, are we going to go back and forth? If, let's say they, they are null, um, the just concluded uh, election, mm -hmm. um, the cycle uh, Theoretically, it can go on indefinitely. Yes, yes, it can. Uh, uh, the Kenya, as you know, h hasn't really had um, a proper judiciary, uh, by which I mean both uh, competence and integrity. Colonial times, the, the judiciary was just another weapon in the colonial uh, uh, power. Um, after independence, unfortunately, that tradition continued, even though the independence constitution did provide complete independence for the judiciary. So when we st were, began work on the constitution, it was pretty clear to us that most of the judges were corrupt and many were also incompetent. Nobody denied that. Even reports made by the judiciary said this. So we felt that uh, we will build a very strong uh, judiciary, strong both in terms of their competence and ability uh, and integrity, but also in the powers we give the judiciary. In a way, we saw the judiciary as the empire of the overall system. And uh, so one thing we did was to uh, uh, basically vet all existing judges and uh, if they had ne uh, either not no integrity, well known for accepting bribes, and or didn't really have the the the, the, the knowledge of the law, but were appointed because the president thought well that person would serve us. Okay, so we saw the constitution as playing a very fundamental role. We knew it was uh, going to be quite a radical constitution, or sometimes we call transformative constitution. And we knew that, uh, or suspected at least, that many politicians would not uh, want to follow the, the discipline of the constitution in terms of its values, in terms of consultation, people's participation, because we, I thought, had an ambitious but necessary constitution. So we wanted to, uh, we, a judiciary to be a kind of empire yes. over the system. And uh, so we gave them a lot of power and we even unusually uh, gave them instructions in how to exercise their powers. Okay. With, due, with constant reference to the constitution, with uh, not a kind of technical, but uh, but responding to the spirit of the constitution. So that gives the judiciary a lot of flexibility, but within the framework of the constitution. And in the beginning, it seemed that, uh, and the Supreme Court itself was a new body. 
we, we then ended the Court of Appeal. So it was a new court and we had very high expectations. And when William Matunga was appointed Chief Justice, Chief Justice. we were delighted. We were yes. uh, and uh, so the, in the beginning, I think the judiciary did a good job. They realized their responsibilities. But uh, it seems to me now that uh, not all the judges have the same commitment uh, as uh, was expected. And they had nothing to fear. Their tenure was guaranteed. Yes. And uh, so, so it was very disappointment, uh, uh, disappointing for me when two judges, three judges didn't come. On the, on, on the, yeah, the first time people went to court on this case. Yes. Uh, so that they couldn't proceed. Yes. And then they had to have a second round of elections before the court had spoken. Yes. So that, I think, was very unfortunate. Um, Prof, um, you know, I'm aware that... Um, we, 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 perhaps you can tell us a little bit about uh, the other country that in Af on the continent of Africa that whose, uh, you know, um, supreme, I think they have the Constitutional Court in South Africa. Mm. And, you know, I know that South Africa is a country that uh, we borrowed from um, in, in terms of uh, the Constitution. Yes. Uh, they have a very good Constitution. It's, mm. it's lauded around the world. Yeah. So is ours. And we borrowed from them. Theirs seems to work better than ours. Yes. Why? Well, I think, uh, uh, yeah, that's a good question because it also tells us something about what a constitution can or cannot do. Exactly. Uh, because in South Africa, the new constitution was a result of the abolition of apartheid yes. and moving towards uh, 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 national unity, identity. And so that whether you are Afrikaner or or Zulu or of Indian origin, you had this commitment to, to, to South Africa. Yes. And, you, and the important element was citizenship. Yes. You had equal rights. Yes. And they very quickly, they formed parties and so on on that basis. Yes. Now we, as you said, were very inspired by them. And so we copied many of their uh, approaches, uh, values, we did the same. We, we wanted a Kenya where everybody would be equal. If you're a citizen, you're a citizen. Uh, we don't look beyond that. And uh, we also s built in structures of the state and a and, um, uh, system of government. And, uh, and because we were impressed by their success, they were 20 years ahead almost of us. So we could look at their system. We were also very impressed by the judiciary in South Africa under the new system. And uh, so we built in a very strong judiciary in our own system. We never had an independent judiciary really until this constitution, not colonial, not, uh, uh, not post-independence. And uh, we vetted, or not we, but we set up a procedure to vet judges for integrity and for uh, competence. And if they didn't satisfy these two tests, they were dismissed. And a new recruitment process started with the new procedure where the, the executive would have no role, an independent commission after interviews, which were which are televised, uh, uh, appointed, right. and then they had this, what we call security of tenure. They couldn't be removed unless uh, good reason, and not decision of the government, but of the, of the same body which appointed them. In the beginning, uh, the the uh, but to come to your question as to why the, the South Africa succeeded and we didn't, is is that uh, uh, they had uh, Mandela. And um, we had, I won't say, but uh, we all know who. <laughs> and uh, he, he was very committed to the values. He had struggled all his life for them, uh, suffered greatly, paid a heavy price, but he never became bitter and he wanted a South Africa that everybody would be proud of and happy in. And so, so in our case, uh, we didn't have that. We had sitting politicians who had been brought up and had also nurtured themselves a very 
unfair oppressive system where they were only concerned about their own welfare and not the broad values that we did put in our own constitution. I think that's a big difference. We we didn't have a Mandela yes. in short. In, in, in the Kenyan context. <laughs> in the Kenyan context. Mm. What are the you know what are the implications? Um, we have a, a Supreme Court that has shown that it can be very indep independent mm. in the adjudication of um, uh, election disputes. Yeah. Um, at least that's the, the, the feeling that one that has emerged out of the decision they took to announce the presidential election on the 1st of September. Yeah. Um, but uh, and many analysts are coming to the conclusion that this is simply a manifestation of a deeper political crisis. Uh, a crisis in the way our our political elite behaves, the values that they, mm. uh, you know, that they demonstrate, they expose one set of values, but actually behave completely differently. Mm. Um, so, what are the potential consequences um, in terms of politically and constitutionally mm. uh, of of the political class repeatedly taking its political problems to the to the mm. Supreme Court yes. in a in a context such as ours? Yes, I think it. Uh, the consequences are, can be quite serious. Uh, the judiciary is often seen as a, a last resort. Yes. You, in a democratic system, yes. you uh, use other mechanisms. You use parliament, yes. you use lobbying, you use pressure. Yes. Uh, and uh, often they are built within the structure of the state. Yes. There are mechanisms built in yes. for raising complaints, dealing with them. Uh, and and the hope is that in a good functioning system, the, the, these complaints will be dealt with uh, rapidly through fair processes. But it's only in the extreme cases that one would need to go to court. Yes. Uh, involving the court in routine questions and often, uh, I mean, it doesn't... Uh, weaken them in any way, but uh, it puts a lot of pressure on them and uh, it drags them more and more into politics, politics. which is they need a, a, a kind of distance from them. Yes. And it also it, uh, puts temptation in the way of the government to try to undermine the judiciary. Because the judiciary has, I have to say, under the new constitution done a very good job. Yes. They have protected our rights. Yes. They have stood up to uh, to the court. Yes. Even today, as we talk, yes. they have been giving good judgments. Yes. Yes. And uh, I myself was called by yes. the head of uh, some uh, some strange body uh, yes. and wanted to send me to jail. The NGO <laughs> and, yeah. and when we went to the court, they said, "No, you don't seem to have a case," uh, and stopped them and said, "Come back." Uh, and then there'll be a proper case, but then, until then, uh, uh, nobody can touch me. So, uh, so, so that kind of function, I think, is very critical, but it should be kind of residual. Yes. If every day we had to go there, uh, then we weaken the... And they also, judiciary uh, makes the decisions after a lot of deliberations, uh, research, listening to lawyers, so, so it's not something they rush into, yes. and to add to the weight of the of their workload is it, not really fair. But uh, uh, so I think uh, what I was very sad when uh, just before the second round of elections, uh, a reference was made to the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and this is an issue of relating to elections, which begins in the and ends in the Supreme mm -hmm. Court, unlike others which work their way up from High Court, yes. Court of Appeal to the thing. Yes. So it it was a very important, uh, uh, critical issue, and uh, it also affected whether or not there would be need for a new uh, vote, uh, and then to find that uh, the the Supreme Court doesn't have a, a quorum, yes. and uh, and now this is extraordinary to me because yes. uh, the date was fixed yes. uh, some time ago, yes. given by the court itself, yes. and uh, all the judges knew they had to be in Nairobi on yes. the date. Yes. Now why is and and the stories we heard why 
some judges were not available and therefore there was no quorum. Yes. Seemed very unconvincing yes. to me, yes. I have to say. Yes. Oh, his helicopter didn't come on time. Yes. Or his this happened. Yes. Uh, I, I don't think they are at all convincing. Yes. And that makes one very worried. Yes. Uh, why were they not there? Yes. And then people have all kinds of speculation. And one is that the government instructed them not to. And the strength of the judiciary is its impartiality. Yes. We all respect the judiciary because we think they are guided by the constitution yes. and the laws. Yes. This is their duty. Yes. This is what they are sworn to. Yes. It's very public process. So, so if the, you know, they start responding to pressure and I should say bribes yes. from the judiciary, from the government, yes. then I'm afraid there's nothing to protect us uh, between the government and and and, the, and and our new culture of the of constitutionalism. Um, professor, you, you mentioned um, that you know society has a whole range of instruments and processes and traditions for solving political problems. You know, you're lobbying, using parliament. Mm -hmm. Before we take these issues to the institution of last resort, like the Supreme Court. Um, and you also mentioned uh, the, the, the kind of challenges that uh, Katiba Institute has faced, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the NGO Coordination Board, um, which uh, my own organization mm -hmm. has also <laughs> faced. Mm -hmm. um, and um, ca can you speak to this the, the issue the role of civil society mm. uh, in Kenya sort of now very fluid political crisis that's unfolding yeah. as we as we go into uh, uh, another um, election petition uh, potential uh, mm. presidential election could yeah. be annulled another election well I think uh, civil society has uh, played an, uh, an extremely uh, important uh, role uh, well, you know, even before this constitution, but certainly since that constitution, and uh, the constitution gives them, you know, all kinds of rights as we are entitled to, uh, to engage in public affairs, to lobby, and so on. And uh, I have been very impressed by the people who, are, like yourself, who commit themselves completely when you had so many other options of doing great things even profitable things, <laughs> but you've chosen to, to f fight for fairness, for the constitution. And so, and they have been bright, they have been well organized, and um, so they, are, they have become an important force. Mm -hmm. And this is what has bothered the government. Mm -hmm. I mean, on the one hand, uh, the government says, we are democratic, mm -hmm. but what is democracy mm -hmm. without civil society? Mm -hmm. So they cannot, that means they're not really interested in democracy. And, um, and they become very vindic vindictive. Uh, and here again, uh, the judiciary has been very, very helpful in yes. keeping, you know, the <coughs> balance yes. between the government and civil society. Yes. Uh, they see society, civil society, as does the constitution, yes. as the bulwark of, of freedom, yes. fairness, and so on. Yes. And uh, so the government, I think, is worried that people are listening more and more to civil society, yes. that uh, people's awareness is, uh, is, is stimulated by civil society. Yes. Civil society has very clear uh, agenda, uh, methods of getting there. So the government doesn't feel comfortable with that and, uh, and uh, harasses us and uh, wastes our time and uh, causes anxiety. Uh, so it's all deliberate. Uh, and the person who is sending all these notices is not even qualified to be in that yeah, office. Position. And it's they don't care about that. No. So that means that the government has no respect for the constitution no. at all. Um, just two, two last questions, um, uh, Prof. Um, we, we have a Constitu uh, petitions have been placed before the Supreme Court that is going to conference and uh, then adjudicate over. Um, uh, there are only two options. Basically, you know, they can find that the op election on the 26th, you know, was was okay and um, president will be sworn in, Uhuru um, Kenyatta will be sworn in. 
Um, on the other hand, they can also find that there were problems with this election process as well, mm -hmm. in which case the, um, the election that we took place on uh, last week um, will, will be annulled. Um, what are the, what, what's the best case scenario? Uh, from okay. you know, from uh, as a uh, as the person who has really played an important role in giving us this wonderful constitution, what's the best case scenarios? How does Kenya? What's the win for mm -hmm. Kenya out of this situation, and what's the potential uh, downside? Well, I, I think the best way forward would now be to uh, to to start all over again, as it were, mm -hmm. which means in this case that. Uh, uh, provided, of course, that there is evidence uh, that there are problems with even the last elections in terms of number of the number of factors uh, which will be raised uh, uh, in the court if, if there's a referendum yes. uh, uh, or if there's a quorum in the court, yes. uh, which um, uh, speak to the breaches of the very clear framework of constitution or of elections that is set out in the constitution, uh, and um, and I think uh, the constitution does of course envisage uh, uh, elections which can be declared void, as was done uh, before by the Supreme Court, yes. and uh, so I think. Uh, this, the best decision will be of the court which enables us to to start all over again, which means, of course, maybe more than um, uh, 60 days, which the law allows them. But this is a kind of situation, what we lawyers call uh, emergency situation, mm -hmm. where the court can, can slightly depart from the prescribed prescribed and my own view is not everybody would agree with me but I would say in this matter of great importance mm. the court could say yes we will have 90 days mm. because part of the excuse now will be well we were only given 60 yes. days what could we do we so of course one could do a lot in 60 days too yes. if you had the will yes. Uh, but at least I think 90 days would be would be reasonable, yes. and uh, and we use civil society that period in our own ways to remind people of the past and the constitution, which shows us the way for the future. Uh, this may or may not uh, lead to any major change, but uh, at least it will ensure a fairer electoral uh, elections, yes. which is important. I mean, if we call ourselves democracy, then elections are a very important <laughs> means uh, uh, yeah, o o of that process called democracy. And uh, if we say we really believe in democracy and then we don't allow elections, don't, you know, or they're rigged, uh, there'd be nothing left for us. Yes. What's the what's the worst case scenario coming out of um, the petitions filed before the Supreme Court now? Well, it's hard to say, but uh, you know, given our our love of violence in mm. Kenya, mm. Uh, there will be a lot of violence. Mm. Uh, there is, as you know, a considerable talk of secession yes. uh, from the coast, mm. and you know, coast people have yes. been asking for it <laughs> for a very very long time. Yes. Uh, but the you know the the the, the West has also been saying, uh, Raila hasn't I think himself personally said, yeah. but uh, uh, Peter Enyang, the great scholar, has said that. Yes. Others have said that, yeah. and uh, and they have built up uh, unfortunately such a at environment atmosphere, and people are both excited and worried, yes. so that. It's hard to say what will happen. Right. We just can't assume mm. that uh, the, everything will be okay. Uh, if you know, even if there's a, a decision this way or that way, and even the leaders who are now you mm. know prompting them yes. will not be able to control them. Yeah. We have seen examples in many many parts of the world, yes. uh, and so it's enormous risk to take yes. to say no. We we have decided now. 
uh, and it goes this way or that way, when it's clear that the second election was an in indication of nothing. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. If anything, it was a kind of vote of no confidence in Huru. Yes. So it's, a, it's not a, a solution I would, in normal circumstances, uh, uh, put forward. But in a very special circumstances, very dangerous circumstances, I think the court ought to, ought to allow more space. Uh, the judiciary, of course, is also worried about their own, not status as such, but you know, um, what can they keep on doing? They have warned us in the earlier decision, a good long decision as to what went wrong and it must be cured. They were very firm about that. They were very clear directions. They can't say we didn't know now. Yes. Very clear directions. And uh, so what can they do? You, we put them in an impossible, impossible position. And that, that's also very unfair. Prof, perhaps we can finish um, with, a, with your comment on um, a new movement that has uh, come out of uh, Kureyangu, South Yangu, yeah. uh, We the People. Yeah. And I, I, I read your article in the Star, yeah. and uh, you can talk. You can talk through that. You made some very important uh, um, recommendations yeah. uh, on the way forward for this uh, new movement. And yes. I think Kenyans would want to hear your view is important. Is well, well, I, I think uh, the idea of, of uh, uh, we the people is important, yes. uh, 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 but exactly how they proceed uh, uh, is not entirely clear. Yes. Uh, my own view would be that um, uh, if if they are just going to be uh, another civil society movement, putting pressure from outside, as it were, yes. they may not achieve all they want to. And so what I have suggested is that they should convert themselves, a particular wing of it, yes. uh, as a political party and enter the fray and, uh, and lobby and get membership, uh, get uh, manifestos and so on and compete and uh, go out to the people and talk to them. One problem with civil society is they are very narrow be centered or or Mombasa, or Kisumu, and, and that's about it. So middle class. So middle class. And so they need to reach out to the people uh, all over the country and the villages. And, uh, and, and if they did all that and, and, uh, and they won, then there will be some hope. Uh, but I think the work they have done is, 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 is commendable, as said, I said earlier. Uh, we should be proud of that, but but we mustn't stop there now. If there were political parties which spoke for the oppressed and we could then throw a weight behind them, but there isn't anything like that. So we have to create, if we believe in democracy, we have to go political ourselves. And that's, that's what I feel very strongly. Thank you very much for, for your time this afternoon. Well, thank you very much. It's really very nice to talk to you, as always.